Hey everybody, Tim Adams back with you this week. I just got back from a men's retreat at Washington Family Ranch, formerly known as Wild Horse Canyon, which in my opinion is a much better name, but there's money and politics involved. It's a camp operated out in the middle of nowhere, beyond the middle of nowhere actually, Central Oregon, uh, by Young Life. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go out there, it is awesome. So what we're going to be talking about this week is kind of a... NAB wrap-up or, or review, if you will, of new cameras that were announced. Um, some may be of worth to you, uh, some may not be, and we're going to kind of go through the big manufacturers, um, JVC, Sony, Canon, Panasonic, and um, Blackmagic, and didn't really touch on Hitachi or Ikigami or, or you know, kind of the the manufacturers of the really big expensive cameras because let's be honest frankly those are kind of out of most of our price ranges so why spend time on them I will tell you this in the research that I've done uh, leading up to this it is definitely the year of 4k and you know as, as far as a capture and display resolution so if you're still in standard definition your days are numbered I'm just going to throw that out there. I know it's a bold statement, but it is what it is. There are uh, camera manufacturers, display manufacturers, already talking about 8K resolution. Uh, NHK, which is the broadcasting entity for Japan, has actually made the bold announcement they're going to be broadcasting um, the next Olympics that they are hosting in 8K resolution, which is pretty audacious. Um, but keep in mind, back in 2007 at NAB, they had NHK was there debuting, if you will, a prototype 8K camera at that point. As with all things, having awesome resolution on the front end is great, but if you can't see it on the back end, the question has to be asked, does it benefit you anything? And we'll get into that a little bit later. So Paul... Um, I know that you've kind of been doing a little looking as well. Um, anything that really jumped out at you in your research before we just dive into JVC? Well, uh, like you were saying, the fact that not only is there no, well, it's not none, but not only can you not find SD cameras these days, you know, they're not announcing, yes, we've got a brand new SD camera. Uh, they're getting to the point where they're not really pouting S, uh, HD cameras. So, you know, 720p is going the way of SD, and 1080p, there are some good deals to be had, I think, that uh, if, if, if you want a system for the next few years, maybe 1080p is the way to go, but don't think, oh yeah, that'll keep us for another 20, because I don't think so. I think maybe 5 and 1080p is going to start looking like uh, SD does right now. So I think that that's one of the key things. I think that there's a couple other things that I noticed uh, about the sensors. There's a lot of dependency on CMOS sensors as opposed to CCDs, which depending on the system they're beautiful but depending on the system sometimes they have that rolling shutter effect which can be really annoying so it's all pluses and minuses I suppose well yeah I mean if if you think of it whenever you're evaluating between two pieces of equipment it really helps to do what I call a balance sheet pros cons and you know just because you have more line items, if you will, on one side of the equation does not necessarily mean that it automatically outweighs the other side, because one of those line, item, line items could be more important than the entire opposite column. So it's really important to know what, know what it is that you're looking for. Um, what is If you're looking to upgrade, what equipment is it that you have now? What is it not giving you the ability to do? Um, now and in the future, which is why it's important. You hear us talk about it all the time, but why it's important to know where you're going, not only as a ministry, but as a church. Now, I did want to um, talk about something really quickly, and that is 
this misconception that 4K and Ultra HD or UHD is the same thing. It's close, but it's not. It's they are they are different resolutions. So 4K is 4,096 pixels by 2,160 pixels. UHD, on the other hand, is 3,840 pixels by 2,160. So what's interesting is that we now have, with 4K, a brand new aspect ratio of 1.9 to 1. So to give you a rough idea, um, 1080p, 1920 by 1080, um, is 1 1.78. And so, and you get that by just, you know, doing simple math. But um, it's interesting because now all of a sudden we have this new aspect ratio to think of, you know, when we're shooting things, when we're doing projection and, and that kind of thing. So 4K is really going to be, <laughs> for, for what it's worth, good or bad, a very disruptive technology. So just throwing that out there. Yeah, something I've noticed in my research, you know, I, I did an article a couple of months ago for uh, Church Production Magazine about streaming in 4K, which we're not there yet, mostly because of bandwidth and other stuff. Maybe in Korea, like South Korea, maybe they can do stuff like that. Any place with Google Fiber, maybe they can do it. But for most churches, even spending a few hundred dollars a month, you're not going to get enough bandwidth up to do live streaming. Um, with that said, I noticed that uh, the so-called 4K display at my local Walmart that they're touting and they're very proud of and it's all by itself and it is beautiful is not actually 4K. So it's like the name 4K is the one that caught on but the resolution is actually UHD. So that's something for you to look at. Um, I, I noticed that one of the companies we're going to talk about later, sometimes 4K means 4K and sometimes 4K means UHD. So you just want to know what you're getting into. Just because it's UHD does not mean it's junk. You know, you're you're missing a little on the side. It's not as wide. It's still gorgeous. UHD. Uh, if you want to think of it this way, think of four 1080p images just put into a grid, and that's UHD. So it's already four times better at UHD than 1080p is. And there wasn't a, it wasn't a long time ago where 1080p was like wow, would we ever need that much resolution? And now the question is, wow, will we ever need 4K? So we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, very similar to what happened with, with HD. You know, the HD spec goes all the way down to 480p. 720p, you know, you have a 1440p, and you've got a 1080p. And so just because something is, let's say, a TV, right, or, or a projector, let's, let's do a projector, right? Just because it says it can do HD doesn't mean you're going to get 1080p out of it. And 1080p and 720p are different aspect ratios. So it's very important, you know, that you line all, all, the, all the specifications up, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's. So with that, we are going to just dive right in here. And I'm going to do a screen share so y'all can see the fun. But before I do that, I need to get on the right tab so I don't give anything away. <laughs> Maybe I just like being in control. I don't know. I like spoilers, though. Come on. Spoilers. <laughs> All right. So we're going to jump into this cute little guy. Meet the JVC gyhm 170 u their uh, brand new compact handheld camcorder. MSRP of $2,200. Kind of a lot for what looks like a glorified uh, consumer camcorder. However, it is not a consumer camcorder. I can promise you that. So uh, here I've just gone ahead and jumped to the specs page. 
So here you have a half inch uh, CMOS sensor. So not as big as you may be thinking, but again, it's not the one third inch CCD that we've gotten used to, um, or that we got used to back in the SD and early HD camera days. Um, so you see it gives you a total of 12 megapixels, which is awesome. This is where we start to break down, and I will mention this, that the lenses that are included on these cameras are not the best. Um, and we'll go over that in more detail, but uh, I'm actually kind of disappointed. The, the lens that JVC has chosen to put on here is actually the best of the ones that, that we're going to be showing in that it goes to f1.2, which is very fast, um, so it lets a lot of light in. Um, it is a, oh crumb, I think it's a 12x or 12 times zoom on this particular model. I'm going to have to go verify that now, but um, we'll verify that next. So what that means is that when it's all the way open and you're widest, you're at f1.2, and when you're all the way zoomed in, it's at f3.5. 3.5 is kind of one of those, it's very close to middle of the road exposures, and it's a good place to be for a live video camera, um, honestly. I don't have any complaints about 3.5. As we get along here, you'll see that number grow. So, And if you're brand new to f-stops and aperture, the way to think of it is the lower the number, the more light gets in, and the better performance out of your camera you're going to get as far as image quality. Uh, when you get up into the higher numbers, um, because not enough light is passing through the lens, you have to compensate it for, for it in other ways. Uh, on a video camera, like built for the purpose video camera like this one, you'll usually have to bump your gain up, and that's down here. And you can see that we have some pretty staggering gain numbers. I mean, I'm used to operating down in the like 3, 6, 9, maybe 12 range um, measured in decibels, as you can see here, but this goes all the way up to... Um, 24, and then they have a low lux. Lux is a, a measurement of light that goes all the way up to 36. I can only imagine how noisy it is. So um, I don't really. Paul, can you explain gain and noise in better terminology than I can? Yeah. So uh, think of it. If you know anything about professional sound, if you have a very quiet signal and you boost that up, you're going to hear a lot of background noise. Video is the same way. If you have a very low light situation and you amplify the light that's there, it doesn't do as good a job as just using more light. So that's why right now I've got uh, five lights in this room in addition to the uh, light in the ceiling fan above me and the reason for that is because I've got a very small little webcam so more light gives you a better image if I were to turn off all my lights which I can do then you see that it's trying to balance out what's going on and it's not doing the best job and in the dark spots, it, it kind of looks like it's fuzzy, like an old-fashioned um, television picture, you know, when you almost got the signal, but not quite, so before we went digital. So I think Tim has a side-by-side a -side comparison between something that's amplified and something that's just using more light with the same subject. Yeah, this is a pretty good example. I think what we're actually looking at is a piece of software, probably a plug-in for a video editing uh, software program that is noise removal. So I don't know who in their right mind would actually uh, be happy with the shot on the left as far as that being an original. I think what we're probably looking at in, in reality is the original shot on the right, and on the left it's been modified to look like what video noise looks like or gain noise. So this is a really extreme example but it's a perfect example because 
I don't know about you, but if I'm shooting a uh, video, you know, even if I'm not a professional, what's on the left is not going to be acceptable. Um, and so for, for you, those of you with the video ministry, um, if this is what you're getting during church um, for your service, I would, I'll actually go out there and stick my neck out and say you just need to stop. <laughs> Invest in proper lighting because that's not a quality image at all. It's nowhere near a quality image. Um, whereas you invest in the right equipment and you're going to get that image that's on the right. It's perfectly exposed, it's well lit, and uh, and it looks great. So that's that's gain. Thanks, Paul, for uh, for saving my neck on that one. All right. So while Paul was talking, I did verify this is a 12 times optical zoom uh, lens. So just going back down. Uh, down here, it does record to SD cards, which is very helpful. Uh, you will want to pay attention if you are getting into um, high bit rate, which is what this is. So that's uh, how many megabits per second it's writing to the media. Um, or if you're getting into 4K at all, you will want to pay attention to what the manufacturer recommends for a recording medium. Uh, in this case, it's an SD card that is a UHS dash one. Um, and SD cards are measured in classes. So as you can see, HD here, they want you to have a class 10 SD card, uh, and then uh, a class 6 SD card for ABC HD. So I'm not going to really get into the nitty gritty here. Um, I'll go ahead and put links to all, all these pages that we're going to show you um, later, or you know, after the event. However, I did want to point out this. It does have an HDMI output. So if you are using HDMI as your kind of your starting point for cameras in a live production system, this is obviously something you like to see. It has an HDMI output. What it does not have is an HDSDI output. Uh, for that, we have to jump to its bigger brother, the HM200U. So this does have uh, the exact same lens and the exact same sensor. Um, so really, all you're really getting is, um, I think you might be getting, yeah, you're getting an SDI output and you're getting XLR microphone inputs. That's really the only difference. And you're looking at a price difference of, this is 3000 and that's just over 2100 So. That's a pretty big jump for just getting those two, but there are some internal electronics that you know you have to have in there for XLR and, and SDI connections. So bear that with a grain of salt. Now notice these are both 4K cameras. Um, now remember, I told you it's the year of the 4K. So we're going to jump over to the LS300. Uh, this is an interchangeable lens camera, so it does not come with a lens unless it's part of a kit that um, your reseller puts together. Um, what's interesting here is it's a Super 35 sensor. And I am going to go to the venerable Paul once again to explain that one. What's a Super 35? Well, um, so think about the size of film back in the day. There was 35 millimeter film that you get for your 35 millimeter camera. That's the size of uh, uh, of the sensor. So there are all different sizes of sensors, and that that really matters um, because if the sensor is small and you we've got adapters for you can take basically any lens and put it on basically any camera that has interchangeable lenses nowadays. But if you want to think of uh, some of them have a very small sensor, some of them have a very large sensor. So depending on how you make that up, it could be that um, apparently you're zoomed in farther because you've got a smaller sensor doing the work of um, a larger sensor. So that's the difference between like a Canon 5D Mark III and a Canon Rebel series. 5D Mark III has a full frame sensor, which is 
about the size of a frame of 35 millimeter film, and the Rebel series with Canon, which is what I have, has what's called a crop sensor, which is a smaller sensor. So since the same amount of light goes through the camera and it lands in a smaller space, then apparently it seems bigger. So that's fine if you're taking uh, more telephoto type images, but it's a problem if you're in a room and you want to take a big wide image of someone, um, like a group or something like that. So with the same lens on these two different cameras, the more expensive camera with the bigger sensor will apparently have a wider shot, whereas uh, the same lens on the sensor, the smaller sensor will have a more zoomed in looking shot. So the 35 millimeter, that's better for that reason, but it's also better because if you think about it, a larger space is going to get more light. And if a larger space gets more light, then uh, you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, a 2.8 on a larger space is going to be brighter than uh, a lens with a 2.8 aperture on a smaller sensor. So I think that's basically, as I understand it, how um, why that's important. Yes, sir. Thank you, as always, Mr. Paul. Um, I can yep. tell you um, that my GH2, my Panasonic GH2, it's a micro four thirds interchangeable lens camera, is a 2x crop sensor. So what that means is if I put a 50 millimeter lens on there, it's effectively a 100 millimeter lens because I'm not the sensor is not seeing the entire image; it's only seeing the center part. So anyway, um, interesting thing here. It's a Micro Four Thirds mount that gives you full coverage. So the Super 35 sensor, um, well, I guess that actually makes sense, <laughs> given what you just said. Never mind. You just stole my thunder, dude. All right, so we get 422 uh, HD recording at 50 megabits. Um, I do want to stress that is full HD. That is not... 4K, that's up here. That's at 150 megabits. <laughs> Three times the data rate. Um, this is really... I mean, let's be honest. This is a digital cinema camera, but I did want to show it to you. Uh, the price point is pretty reasonable, and it does have HDSDI for those of you that want it. So price point on this is under $4,400, so street price is probably going to be a little over four grand which for a Super 35 is pretty darn good. So, uh, any questions about the JVC stuff before we move over to Sony? No? Okay, good. So, Sony, this is pretty much what I found. It's a camcorder, consumer camcorder, uh, an FDR AX33. Its biggest claim to fame is it's 4K 100 megabit recording. It's 30% smaller and 20% lighter than the predecessor, the FDR AX100. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> and like I said, I mean, I searched and searched and searched, and I just could not find anything from Sony from this last uh, NAB that was, you know, camera related, other than some of their um, I mean, they did come out with 4K cameras, but I didn't find anything that was really noteworthy. So they do make good good products, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem that 2015 was a good year to talk about them. So we're moving on to Canon, who has this cute little guy, the XT10. A um, couple of interesting features on this is that it has a rotating hand grip, which is kind of cool has what they call a very angle LCD, so that pops out at the bottom here. And uh, you can have it at different angles, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it is a full one inch sensor. So that's actually a larger sensor than uh, what you would typically find in a video camera. However, it has the worst 
lens of the bunch. It's a 10 times optical zoom with a f2.8 to 5.6. Now remember I said that the higher the number, <laughs> the darker the image is going to be. So what's really surprising to me about this is that for a 10 times zoom, remember the JVCs were 12 times, um, for such a relatively short optical zoom range, they certainly have put in a much, a very, very wide uh, aperture range. Um, honestly, and I'm really disappointed in Canon in, in this particular regard. Uh, the other thing I'm really disappointed with them in is that the lens that comes with the camera is the only lens that can work with that camera. It is not inter interchangeable. Um, it so, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this guy, but it is a very disappointing camera to me. It's cute, but it's disappointing as far as, you know, the actual specs. Um, gain, yeah, I don't even want to talk about that. I mean, it goes to 42 decibel. So, I mean, 36 on the JVCs, and uh, this one goes to 42, so... Definitely not a good low-light camera, despite the fact that it has a full one-inch sensor. So generally speaking, the larger the sensor, the better it is in low-light, because um, there's more, you know, well, there's larger pixels. Let's put it out that way. So with that, we are going to jump to the Panasonic. Now, I don't know about you, but this thing looks like an Italian supercar. I'm sorry. It is sexy. I, I have to be honest. Um, carbon fiber. It's, it's got that awesome red cover for the audio controls. I mean, come on. Give it up for Panasonic for style, you know, at the very least. And, again, this is a 4K camera. And let's see, let's go over some of the specs here. It is a 4 third inch sensor, so remember I said on the Canon it is a 1 inch sensor. This is actually larger than that, if I know my my fractions here. Uh, what's also pretty cool about this is it's a 13 time optical zoom, so it is the longest zoom lens of the bunch that we've looked at so far. Um, Really not designed for live production, I, I will um, say that. It does say live event shooters, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. But what I mean by it's not really designed for live event is that a true live event built for the purpose camera is going to have a lot, <laughs> a much longer optical zoom range than that. Um, 20 times is kind of typical, and... You know, like I said before, I've been really, really disappointed um, in the lens options available, or, or the lenses that have that are coming installed on these cameras. Um, because as somebody who has done a lot of event work, a 13 time optical zoom is just not going to get you where you need to be, unless you're in a really small environment. Paul? Yeah. I don't know. I heard somebody's mic click off, so. I thought somebody was going to say something. No, no, I I did just adjust the light behind me, so maybe okay. that would be plugging back in. Gotcha. All right, so uh, one other cool thing about this camera is the V-Log L gamma curve. Um, and what's cool about that is really from a film standpoint, uh, it can it can blend, the footage can blend really well with the Vericam family, which are much more expensive cameras. <laughs> So um, here you can see that it does deliver true 4K, 4096 by 2160 at 24 frames a second, uh, or UHD, which is the 3840 by 2160, uh, up to 60 frames a second in either MP4 or MOV. Uh, it does that by recording to dual SD card slots, and as you can see, here's that recommended speed. Um, and these are these are the new class, the new the new guys on the block in SD cards. So they are going to be a little bit more expensive than, than the older stuff. Um, another cool thing is if all you're doing is recording or using this in 1080p, you can shoot with a frame rate of up to 120 frames per second, which when you play it back at 30 frames a second, 
you're going to get some incredible slow motion. So that's really cool. Uh, again, here's that variable zoom lens, or your aperture, I should say. So 2.8 to 4.5, not as good as the JVC, certainly not as bad as the um, Canon. And, you know, we, we get some, some more stuff in here. It's got a 5-axis image stabilizer, which is kind of cool. Not really helpful if you got it on tripod like you should. <laughs> um, so, like I said, I will um, I'll put all these links in there. This is all I could find on this camera. It is so new; it's not shipping. Um, I don't even have a price point on it at this point. So, hopefully, we'll get that soon. But um, what I where I really want to spend the bulk of my time is Blackmagic. Um, they had an incredible NAB. They came out with four new camera um, announcements. Um, it's really more like six new, well, one, two, yeah, like six new camera models. Um, I did want to mention the Black Ur Blackmagic Ursa um, Mini. So this is the miniature version of the larger Ursa. Uh, both come in a 4.6K and a 4K flavor. Um, and I, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because of the lens mount options. I don't want people getting confused. Um, this is really designed for filmmaking, uh, not for live events. And what makes me say that is you have a PL mount, which is for cinema lenses, and you have an EF mount, which is for Canon lenses. Now, there are going to be some people out there, I know it, so I'm just going to deal with it right now, that are going to swear that you can use DSLR lenses to shoot live events. I will agree. But if you're doing it as part of a live production system, then I will disagree. And the reason for that is because even if you can connect your DSLRs to a central, you know, to a switcher via HDMI, some cobbled together Frankenstein system that will do it, does not mean that you have a viable live production system. A live production system or a live production camera, let's put it that way, will have a lens that has servos in it to run both the focus and the zoom. I haven't seen an EF lens from Canon yet that will do that. I'm just going to put that out there. And until I do, I will not agree that DSLR lenses are up to snuff in a live production system. Um, Paul, do you have any comment on that? Well, I agree. I've seen um, a Kickstarter where they were talking about doing something about that, but really, once you've used a good production lens, trying to use something that's not designed for live video, it it's just like going from uh, dancing with Ginger Rogers to dancing with me, you know, it's just not even in the same ballpark. It's hard to believe we're the same species. Um, so I think that that's what we're dealing with is you can fake a lot of things. You can do a lot of work. I've, I've shot live events with the DSLR before. It, it's possible to do. It's just not delightful. It's not, you know, doing a slow zoom in to establish your shot is difficult at best, nearly impossible, and uh, you've got to put your hand on the lens to do it, and that in, uh, adds in camera shake. There's just a lot of reasons why it's less than ideal. So if you've got the choice, it would be better to have uh, like the B-mount lens, you know, uh, like a Fujinon lens or something like that where it's really designed to do it and you can get a nice, slow, steady, beautiful zoom in and a uh, real fast snap zoom if you need it and you're just able to do all that and you, you just can't with the DSLR. Well, I will agree. You know, even a $300 consumer cam camcorder is going to have the, the zoom rocker uh, in some flavor that 
is really designed to give you somewhat smooth um, zoom in and zoom out capability. Um, now, obviously, that's one of the things that improves when you step up uh, the quality of the camera is the servos. And so, you know, when you get into the five, six thousand dollar camera range, you're going to start getting those really, really nice servos. Um, and then, you know, it goes up from there. But I. Yeah, I just want to make that point that DSLRs are great for getting really high quality imagery. They're not so great um, for doing live production. And honestly, I know that they're really tempting with their price points, and the interchangeable lenses are just really tempting, gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of versatility uh, in terms of making an investment once and you know getting a lot of uses out of it. And generally speaking, I'm a fan of equipment that can do that. However, um, I kind of look at it as using a screwdriver for the job of a hammer. You know, just because it can work doesn't mean that it's the best tool for the job. And for something as critical as live production, especially if you're live streaming or doing iMag on your on your screens, any little camera jiggle, especially when you're zoomed in, is just going to be magnified you know, exponentially on a screen that size. Um, and, I mean, that's that's just tip of the iceberg. So I just, I wanted to mention that before we moved on. And um, I'm going to wrap up by talking about this camera. Uh, this is one of the four cameras that was announced uh, at, at NAB this year by Blackmagic. They're calling it the world's smallest Ultra HD live studio camera. There's a couple caveats to this camera though. Um, one, obviously it doesn't come with any lenses. It is very small. Um, you know, we'll get down to some uh, some measurements here. It's somewhere. I don't know. We'll find it. Anyway, um, so here, you know, I've got kind of this, this cable cam arena type camera, which normally is about a million dollars to buy and install. Um, for a facility, and obviously this is not a <laughs> million dollars. I don't know how much this costs, but anyway. Um, so let's let's just kind of take a tour around here. You got HDMI output here. You have this kind of vague expansion port, which we'll get into because I know Paul has some stuff to talk about that. You've got you know some very basic buttons here for configuration. Uh, one thing that Paul pointed out that is you know kind of a glaring. Uh, omission is a screen. And I believe the reason that there is not a screen on this is twofold. One, it's because this is really meant to be a remote camera, not necessarily something that an operator would stand behind. But also, number two, it gives them, it gives Blackmagic the opportunity to sell more of their brand new video assists, which is uh, a combination um, five inch LCD monitor and recorder. And, you know, it's, it's very nicely priced and, and that kind of thing, but having a screen on here would have been kind of nice, but I understand why they didn't do it. Um, so flipping around to the other side here, we have a microphone input, a headphone output, and we have HDSDI in and out. Uh, now, you may be asking, why do you want an HDSDI input on a camera? And then this is a Canon-compatible battery on the back. So one of the... Uh, advantages of SDI is that you get a fairly broad transportation pipe and what you can do with that is you can send uh, various information from the switcher or from the master control if you will back down the same SDI line back to the camera. So um, here you have kind of specs at a glance. It's got a micro four thirds lens mount. You do have a stereo mic. You also have a um, stereo mini jack audio input. I don't know why we need to see it's an RGB LED, but anyway, it has USB and it's made out of magnesium. Uh, so let's talk about that expansion port. And to do that, we're going to go to customization. The world's most expandable studio camera. All right. So here they give you a pinout um, of, you know, it's what we call an HD15. You may recognize it as very similar to a VGA connector. Um, but this is kind of all the cool things that you can build into it. So you have one connector, 
and you have all of these connections on what we call a breakout cable. So for example, you can have 12 volt DC power, Genlock, uh, which if you ever run HDSDI, Genlock is your friend, uh, LENC, so you can control your zoom and focus with a uh, LENC controller, which are pretty reasonably priced, they're only a couple hundred bucks, which is nice. Um, B4 communication. Now, Paul, I'm going to cue you up ahead of time. I want you to talk about why B4 communication is important. Um, and then you kind of have this, these two connectors here for, say, a remote mount, um, like we saw in the last page with uh, this cool guy who's kind of programming his mount here. So, Paul... Talk to me about B4. What What is B4 and why is that important? So that's a broadcast quality mount. Um, so there's a caveat that I'm a little concerned about because this yes. is the first uh, studio camera that they've released with a micro four-third lens mount. But let's go to the the B4. Uh, so, if you want to use a broadcast quality lens, typically they have one of the mounts is a B4 type mount, and that doesn't mean anything other than that's what they call that, so that you know, oh, well, this camera has a B4 mount. Well, I have a B4 lens. I can put those together. That's all you need to know about that. But there are a couple of things, like a broadcast lens tends to have uh, these servos inside little motors that allow you to zoom in and zoom out without actually manually rotating the lens. You're, you're actually pressing a button and the button causes the lens to move in and out. So that's good, but where, where do you get the power for that? You know, if you've got a DSLR, for example, you know that your lens, you put it on and it might have a couple of doohickeys on it, a couple of contacts, but that's not exactly the same thing. That's for autofocus and some information there. So where do you get the power for that? Well, on a professional camera, there is a cable that provides power, but it also allows you to do things that maybe you're not used to, like the camera operator doesn't have to control the aperture of the camera there's someone that has a position called shader where they have basically a remote control where they can change uh, how wide open the lens is and how narrow it is. So the, the shader can do that. So there are a few different things that you can do through this cable that while you can kind of do it do it yourself, make your own cable just to get power to the lens so that it could zoom, you wouldn't have control of it in the same way. So that's kind of a big thing, assuming that it works right. Uh, Blackmagic is also selling an adapter that is called uh, is a B4 to micro four thirds adapter, so you could potentially put uh, like a Fujinon lens or a broadcast lens on it, so that sounds good. The question I have that I haven't seen answered yet is if you, with the previous generation of camera, if you tried to do that, like you bought a third-party adapter, as soon as you zoom out wide, you'd get what's called vignetting. And basically what that means is you've got a smaller um, amount of light that's coming out of the lens size-wise, like it's a smaller circle than the size of the sensor. So around the edge, it's not getting any visual in information whatsoever. It's only getting the visual information in the center. So you get this kind of... Well, if you want it, it can be a very pleasing look. But if you don't want it, then that's a problem. And that's the concern I have. I really like what I'm reading about this camera with that exception. I'm afraid that I'm going to get 
uh, a great lens for it. I'm going to have this camera. I'm going to have the adapter. I'm going to have everything that I need. And then when I zoom out all the way, oh, look, it's vignette. It's like circled around. Um, and if I don't want that, I want to not have that. So effectively, that would limit the zoom range that I have. I could only zoom out so far. I could zoom in so far. But since it's a smaller sensor, I'm, I'm just, I don't have as much room to play with, which when you're in a church and chances are it's not like the Dave Letterman show or something like that where they, they'll they let you put the cameras up on the stage with the person you're shooting. No, in a church, typically the cameras go way far at the back. So if you're way far at the back, you need as much zoom as you can get. So that's my concern, and uh, I think it'll potentially be great, or depending on what they did. could be that adapter fixes that, or it could be it doesn't. It's just a piece of metal that makes the lens fit, but that's all it does. So Right, exactly. And here you can see what vignetting looks like um, in what uh, Paul was describing. So... Um, you know, essentially you're seeing the edges of the lens uh, when you're not supposed to. Um, and here's an example of a food, or in this case, a Canon ENG lens B4 with an adapter. This is on some flavor of a DSLR, but this would be your, your zoom control back here. Um, and as you can see, there's a cable that comes out and uh, would come up and connect to the, the lens here. There's a separate cable for focus that would uh, connect to and put somewhere else on the lens. So that's what Paul's talking about um, as far as B4 lenses. Now, why this is important is because last year when uh, Blackmagic introduced, let me just um, go to their products here, they introduced their studio camera. Um, they had kind of make, taken a pretty big misstep. Um, and we will go take a look at that. It looks really cool. Blackmagic spends a lot of money on photography and, you know, post-production to, to get it looking like this. And one of the big things they loved is that it's got this huge 10-inch monitor. Yeah, well, it's at a fixed angle. You can't adjust it. So that was issue number one. Uh, issue number two is that that is an active micro four-thirds lens and there's not a four-thirds lens on the product or on the planet that has what we're you know talking about right now and that is servo zoom and focus. The closest you can get is this LANC connector uh, which does work to a certain degree um, but not as well and sure you know, you can you can get an adapter, but again, where is that power coming from? Uh, there are there is a company that that does make an adapter for that, but you don't want to know what it costs. So, other than that, other than that issue that you know it doesn't have an included viewfinder, um, and we're not really sure about this lens adapter for the B4. It seems like a pretty darn cool camera. Um, it's the one that I'm most excited about. Um, well, it's not the one. There's a variation of this that also came out that I'm excited about. But um, it's a pretty pretty cool little camera. And, and the fact that, I mean, you can see here just how small it is, um, that something this size is giving you full 4K um, is pretty darn impressive. And, you know, if, if you like to get into the DIY stuff here, you, you can see their, their video assist, you know, where you have a multi-angle um, ball adapter here um, so you can monitor and record. You know, it, it's pretty cool. So you can operate it, but you can see here, this is a uh, micro four thirds lens, and he's having to adjust it manually. This is what we're trying to get away from in a live environment because again if you're touching a lens when it's 
you know, a 200 millimeter lens, which is what you're going to need if you're shooting 50 feet or more, um, that's not what you want. <laughs> it's just not good. So uh, here's that LENC remote. Um, you know, Bebob would be who I would recommend. I love their, their remotes. It's just good stuff. Um, you know, you got batteries. But here's the intriguing part, you know, 1300 bucks, And that may seem like a lot, but I guarantee you it's one of the cheapest 4K cameras on the market um, with this level of control, you know. And you remember that price jump way back in the JVCs over here where this was $2,200 and it jumped up to 3000 Okay, remember we added the HDSDI and we added the XLR microphone inputs. Um, Jumping over here, this doesn't have XLR, but it has HDSDI. And, um, you know, again, 1300 bucks. Now, yeah, you're going to spend the money on, on lenses and, and other things like a monitor to get this kitted out, but for what you're getting, it's I would seriously consider looking at this, um, given that there are workable solutions to... Um, or a workable solution to the lens issue, uh, or at least the potential lens issue. Um, so with that, I will stop the screen share so we can come back to me. Do we have any questions? Um, hopefully that has kind of gone over. Those are kind of the notable announcements that I was able to come across. Um, you know, it's certainly not a comprehensive overview because, um, you know, there's probably three or four hundred vendors <laughs> at NAB and who knows who came out with what, you know, really cool product. But um, I think we've done a pretty good job of showing you what was kind of out there right now, uh, what caught our eye. Um, Charles, you've been kind of quiet this evening. What are you thinking? Um, nothing much. I mean, honestly, most of this stuff is kind of... Because, <laughs> you know, for a small church like me, 4K is... Boom way on the horizon for me, especially considering from a streaming standpoint, I mean, Paul uh, hinted at it earlier, you know, if you're in a small church environment and live streaming is your focus, you're not going to be looking at 4K for a long time because of bandwidth speeds. But, right. if you're looking to record locally to 4K, there's benefit to all this. But of course, you know, while we were talking about all this, that made me go back and look at the cameras we've got in two of our churches just comparing specs so it, it, it definitely launched me into a comparison of like well here's where we are and here's where we could be one of these days well good absolutely and you know honestly uh, Paul I don't know if you and I are going to see eye to eye on this I think we will but I think if you're going to spend money um, depending on what you want to do with your video ministry um, if you're going to spend money, if you're going to invest in, in an area of tech, I think you'd probably be better served to invest in proper lighting, um, at least to begin with, because when you get your stage or your platform, whatever you want to call it, when you get that lit properly, then you can get away with starting with lower quality cameras, uh, because you can control the light. You know, and then you can build from there. Paul, would you would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, counterintuitively, if you want good video, you need good sound and good lights, even more than you need a good camera. Um, because if you have good lights, that'll cover an an iffy camera. If you have good sound, people won't be they won't notice as much. I think there was actually a study done where someone compared uh, two video shots, one with a kind of bad camera but great sound, and one with a uh, great camera and bad sound, and people thought that the great camera and bad sound was lower resolution than the bad camera and great sound. So uh, that lighting, that's why I've doing my best to have studio lighting even though I've got a Logitech webcam that I'm shooting with in this situation. Just It covers uh, a multitude of sins. I, was, I do want to touch on one advantage of 4K that we haven't mentioned and that's especially if 
you're still uh, on your screens at your church, you're at 1080p or less. If you're at 1080p or less, but let's say you record a video during the week, it's a message from the pastor. Maybe it's a uh, man on the street, word on the street, street, or whatever you call it. Uh, maybe it's like a drama thing. Uh, if you record that during the week and then you show it during your church service and you record it at 4K, but you can only show it at 1080p or less, you've got all kinds of choices because a 4K image is over four times as big. So you can zoom out all the way, lose some resolution, uh, and put the entire image on there, or you can punch into any quadrant of the, the screen, and it's going to be just as sharp. So while I don't know that I would say, well, you have to buy a 4K camera today, if the money's there and you're like, well, but we don't need it right now, and it's something that's kind of thrown in for free, you know, like the other features you do need, if you're recording video pieces in advance, it's really nice to have that as an option to be able to fake a second camera, for example, because you can digitally zoom in with no change in resolution. That's nice. I mean, we used to fake such things back in the SD days, and it got all kinds of blurry and pixelated when you would do that. And some people sometimes wouldn't notice. This way, no one is going to notice, and that's pretty awesome. And you'll be more future-proofed in the future, so that when your church does go to a 4K screen, you know, in 5, 10 years or whatever, then you've already got the ability to shoot for that. So it's, uh, there are a couple of advantages. I'm not saying you have to do it today, but just something to keep in mind. Well, and something that you mentioned, uh, Paul, earlier is that with this new wave of 4K um, equipment, there's going to be deals out there on HD equipment. It, it, it will be used, certainly. Um, but if it's well taken care of, then you can get another five, ten years out of it, no problem. You know, particularly if it's recording on solid state media, um, where the only moving parts is is the lens. You know, and um, that's fairly easily serviced. You know, different manufacturers have different processes for that. But um, you know, if if you're stuck on SD and you have been for a while, you've, you've had your eye on HD, you know, moving to HD at some point in the future, I'd say start looking because, you know, it used to be, um, let's, let's take Sony, you know, an NX5U camera, it's still going to be around five grand even today, and that camera is like two years old. Um, and, you know, we just looked at two, three JVC 4K models that were under that price point. So I think the point that, or one of the points that Paul is making is that if you're going to invest the money now, you might as well future-proof yourself as much as possible. Most of these 4K cameras can also shoot HD just as well. So, you know, if you're going to be spending the money anyway, I would, cons I would encourage you to at least consider going to 4K. Um, seeing what your options are from, you know, Sony, Panasonic, uh, Canon, JVC, those are kind of the big four. And, you know, I, I'm usually not the guy that's a big fan of saying, you know, go spend lots of money because the technology is really cool. Um, and, and I don't want to come across that way. I do want to come across from the standpoint of, if you're going to be making the investment, then make sure that the investment is going to last you. You know, I'm you know, I'm definitely a fan of that. And if you can make a foundational purchase now that you don't have to replace for 10 years, I can't think of a better um, stewardship decision than that. 
you know, a lot of guys, a lot of churches are going to, to LED lights, and, you know, that could be a 20-year solution. Yeah, you're going to have to upkeep them, certainly, get them cleaned out periodically, that kind of thing, but, you know, you're not going to have to replace bulbs, because there are no bulbs. There's just diodes, and they don't blow up. They just get dimmer. Um, now, there's a caveat to that. You know, if you get the cheapest of the cheap, then that's gonna not going to last you 20 years. I'm sorry, it's just not. Um, if it lasts 10 years, I'd be impressed. And that's, you know, coming from somebody who's made a wrong decision and I've had to pay for it. So I think it's safe to say that there is a minimum level. There always has been a minimum level of investment that is going to be required to get into video. I mean, there's no way around it. You're not going to get into it for free unless you know some really wealthy people that donate to you or, you know, there are exceptions. But by and large, you're going to have to buy equipment. And a lot of people can get really surprised and get really bad sticker shock when, you know, they, they get that wall of reality hits them in the face and they say, okay, this is what we want to do and this is what it's going to cost. And they're like, oh, it's mid-five figures. Okay. They weren't expecting that. So, you know, do your research, know what you're going to have to spend ahead of time, but like Paul was saying, and, and like I've been saying, you know, if, if you can get away with 4K for about the same cost, it might cost you a little bit more, it may cost you a little less than you think. Just do the research, and if you don't know where to start, um, shoot me or Paul an email, um, we'll, we'll definitely put that out um, on the event page for you and on the, on the YouTube page. Um, we're happy to help, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, we're not going to charge you money for emailing, I promise, at least on my part. I'm pretty sure Paul won't, but I'll let him speak to that himself. But, um, you know, the, these church tech communities are really there to support. And, you know, the best step that you can take as somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, um, there's no shame in that, you know, and I don't want you to feel ashamed of that, is to ask for help, you know, to say, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what the terminology is. I don't know, you know, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> that's a great place to start. That's where I started. I'm sure that's where Paul started um, low those, those few years ago. And just being able to admit you need help is a really big step. So please, utilize us as resources. Um, I'm going to open it up one more time for questions before we, uh, we close it off. Charles, are you good? Thumbs up. LaJuan, questions? He's good. All right. Paul, anything in closing? No, I, I think we just live in a great time. You know, what could the Apostle Paul have done with what we have? With an iPhone, what could he have done? I mean, uh, just with papyrus and vellum and uh, ink that you can make yourself if you knew how with stuff you find in your backyard about half of the New Testament you know so we have the ability to really change the world and I'm excited by what we can do don't get uh, caught up thinking that the church is on her way out. She is not. She's alive and kicking, and there are parts of the world where it's forcefully advancing in ways that we can't imagine. And I've seen 30,000 people come to Christ in, in a moment. So just think of what these tools, because that's all they are. It's just a tool. Technology is just a tool. Whether it's a sharpened stick that you dip in do-it-yourself ink and write on papyrus 2,000 years ago, or it's 4K streaming from a drone, you know, it's, it's all just a bunch of tools, and we can really impact lives in eternity. So that's what I get excited about. It shows, brother. It shows. Well, thanks, everybody, for being a part of this. Um, sorry, it's not as interactive as it usually is, but um, this is definitely one that I wanted to to kind of get done before too much time had passed. 
uh, from NAB, which was uh, middle of last month. So a lot of stuff coming down the pipe as far as uh, things that I'd like to, that I'm interested in covering. Uh, so keep keep in the communities. Uh, that's where we announce these. And um, if you want to subscribe to this YouTube channel, go for it. And, um, you know, that'll help us connect with you and um, help us be even more of a resource to you. So thanks for watching. And until next time, God bless.